Lisa Stringfellow writes middle grade fa- fiction and has a not so secret fondness for fantasy with a dark twist. Her debut fantasy, A Comb of Wishes, is published by HarperCollins Quill Tree Books and was released on February 8th, 2022. It was named both an ABA Indie Introduce and an Indie Next Kids title. Congratulations, Lisa. Her work often reflects her West Indian and Black Southern heritage. Lisa, over to you. Thank you all so much. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm going to read from the beginning. And the only thing that I feel like um, you might want a little introduction to is the beginning of chapter one starts with the words crick crack. And that's a storytelling frame that's very common in many islands in the Caribbean, kind of as a way um, to create a call and response between the audience and the storyteller. So all of the chapters um, that are told from the mermaid's point of view, my mermaid Ophidia, are, start with that uh, crick crack. So that's where we begin with chapter one. Chapter one, crick crack. I say crick, you say crack. Crick crack, this is a story. Down past the islands lit by the sun, beyond twilight swells of dusky sea, through midnight veils of the crushing abyss, another world hides under the waves, the other side of the mirror as it's known. Through these depths swam a sea woman. The full moon rose and spilled its milk into the water and light glimmered over dark brown skin. Her scales flashed green and gold foreboding drifted on the tide and urged her on. When she reached the cavern, the quiet struck her first. No gentle trill greeted her as it usually did. In her hiding place, only a broken tumble of rocks and stones remained. Hope dissolved as she groped through the cavern, trembling. Her tail fin thrashed as she plunged her arms into every corner. But the silence told her that the box was gone. Her pupils narrowed to dangerous slits. The sea woman rode the cold currents into the briny deep. She would reclaim the box and what was inside. She must. Time and tides would decide. Crick, crack, the story is put on you. Chapter two, sinking sand. The note waited on the kitchen table. Keela didn't even have to pick it up or read Pop's blocky print to know what it said. Her fingers hesitated over the paper. She and Pop hadn't gone diving or done anything normal together in months. She missed the salty mist on her face and the trampolining waves. Keela lifted the note and balled it in her fist. She took a deep breath and then shut the door of the empty house. The gravel crunched under Keela's feet as she crossed the street into the dense patch of trees. A foot-worn path wound its way between towering cabbage palms and sandbox trees. The gully sloped and she stepped around the snaking roots of a bearded fig. Leaves rustled overhead. A monkey bow. With the push of a branch, the forest ended. Kilo looked out at the waves lapping the shore, the beach, the one place that felt like home. She walked along the water's edge, her canvas bag hanging lightly from her shoulder. When Kilo was five, she had found the first piece of sea glass, blue like a cloudless sky. You found a mermaid's tear, Mum had said. Let's try to find a whole rainbow. They had found every color but orange the rarest. Now, Keela stayed up at night thinking about that last piece, Mum's piece. Keela peeked into her bag at what she had collected that week. Several pieces of sea glass, sharp edges worn away by water and sand. The colors rippled like the surf, translucent green, white, and a piece that glowed golden amber. Her mother had taught her to make jewelry from these gems of the sea. 
When something caught her eye, she tried to imagine how a person could wear it. A charm hanging from a crocheted necklace, wrapped in wire to make an anklet. She never knew exactly what she was going to make until she got started. In these broken bits of glass, trash to some, Kila saw possibilities. The broken made beautiful. She took out a piece and held it to the sky. Green brightness spilled softly into her hand. She remembered the old island folktale about sea glass. Could sadness really make something so beautiful? Kila! Kila turned towards the voice and her face fell. Her friend Lissy stepped out from the trees and walked to her. How'd you know I'd be here? Kila asked in a low voice. Where else would you be? Lissy replied. But ever since... She paused, her eyes searching the water as if the right words would jump out like flying fish. It just seems like you always come without me now. Keela dropped the sea glass she was holding back into her bag. Lissy was right. Three months ago, they would have been on this beach together. Did I do something wrong? Lissy's brown eyes stared fixed fixedly at Keela. No, Keela said. She shifted her feet. I know things are hard, Lissy said softly. I hear Gran talking with your dad. She looked down. Whatever you're feeling, we don't have to talk about it, but we can if you want. Keela remembered the fun that she and Lissy once had together, exploring the beach, watching the sanderlings scoot along the shore. She pushed Lissy's friendship away and liked diving with Pop. She missed that too. All right, Keela said. Lissy squeezed Keela's hand and pulled a bag out of her own pocket. Did you find any sea glass yet? Some, Keela said with a slight smile, but there's not much here. Let's head up the beach then, Lissy said. The shore snaked before them and the girls followed the tide line, raking the sand excuse me, with their feet as they looked for treasure. A heart-shaped pebble was the first to disappear into Keela's canvas bag. Small pieces of driftwood, sea beans, and a couple of pieces of sea glass went into the salty folds. She didn't collect shells. Pop had explained how important shells were when she was little. They prevented beach erosion, provided homes and hiding place for animals, and were even food for creatures that lived in the sand. If you want to keep St. Rita beautiful, he had said, leave them where you find them. But sea glass... That was just the sea returning what people had thrown away. The jewelry you left with Gran is some of your best, Lissy said. Are you still planning to apply for the creative arts program? I don't know, Keela said quietly. When she first learned of the program for gifted young Caribbean artists, it had seemed perfect. 12 weeks of inspiring classes full of happy, carefree kids, like the kind that she used to be. She changed the subject. What have you been up to? Keela asked. This was the most that she and Lissy had talked in weeks. Oh, the usual, Lissy said, helping Gran in the shop. Business is picking up now that it's tourist season. She lets me help on the register. Lissy's Gran, Miss Innes, sold everything from sunglasses to homemade coconut sweetbread and Keela's jewelry. That makes sense. You're good with math. Keep me company tomorrow, Lissy said. Promise. She stuck out she wanted to challenge Keela's teacup manners. Keela wanted to laugh, but her stomach rolled. In her 12 years, she had never broken a pinky promise with Lissy. She hooked her pinky, pinky with Lissy's, I promise. Farther down the beach, they came to a tall wooden fence that extended from the hill to the water's edge. A large sign read, Coral Gardens Cave, no trespassing. They were at the border of one of St. Rita's most beautiful nature parks. Hidden beneath the ground were sea-facing caves, natural rock pools, and a coral floor. But it was also off-limits. Not only was, there access, was the access monitored with security cameras, it was dangerous to enter from this side of the park. Pop had also often warned her that a wrong step on the slippery rocks could mean a nasty gash or even worse, a steep fall and a broken neck. Maybe we'll have better luck tomorrow, Lissy said, kicking the sand and turning back the way they had come. Yeah, 
Kayla said. She turned to you and then stopped. A faint warbling hum, like the singing of tree frogs, floated on the breeze. She scanned the thick green hillside, but she wasn't sure where it was coming from. What was it? Lucy walked ahead and didn't seem to notice. Do you hear that? Kila asked. Hear what? That sound. I think it's coming from up the hill. Lucy turned. I don't hear anything. Part of Kila knew that she should let it go, but the sound called to her. She remembered the stories of magic that Mum had read to her. Lucy couldn't hear it. Maybe it was just for Keela. I want to see where it's coming from, Keela said. Lissy blinked. You mean climb up there? She tilted her head in the direction of the slope. Just for a minute, Keela scrambled up the bank. Watch your step. Keela, Lissy stumbled behind her. We're not supposed to go up there. Keela clambered up the steep hill over the tree roots and the rocks. Her foot slipped, but she grabbed a palm frond to steady herself. The warbling hum trilled again, louder and more insistent. She cocked her head to pinpoint the sound. At the top of the hill, the ground leveled. A tree had fallen on a fence, splintering the wood slats and creating an opening into the nature park. Wait, Lissy huffed behind her. Why are you doing this? Lissy was right. Pop would be furious if he knew she was here. And if the park security found them, there'd be in even more trouble. Keela turned to her friend. I have to look. She wished that she could explain, but the feeling refused to be wrapped up in words. It was as if the strange humming sound had flowed over and around the pieces of Keela's broken heart, and her heart wanted more. I hear you. I'm coming. Keela climbed carefully over the tree and onto the other side of the fence. Lissy hesitated and then followed in silent acceptance. A short distance away, Keela stopped. The hum pulsed louder in her ears. The rocky ground had crumbled to form a sinkhole. Faint light glowed from below, and Keela could see rough outcrops of rock that angled down. What's down there, she whispered, crouching low to peer into the pit. Lissy shook her head. You can't. What if you get hurt? I'll be careful, Keela said, turning backwards and inching her way down. Step by slow step, she probed for solid footing and lowered her body into the void. She didn't realize that she'd been holding her breath until her feet touched bottom. She turned and squinted into the expanse of the cave. An angular shape crouched in the sand a few feet ahead. Not rocks, perhaps trash that had washed in from the ocean. It rested curiously out of place. Keela, are you all right? Lissy called. Her voice echoed off the cave walls. I'm fine, Keela replied, waving at her friend who was lying flat on the ground at the top of the hole. Give me a minute. As she focused on the dim shape, the air bit with unnatural cold. Her skin prickled as she stepped gingerly across the sharp rocks. She extended her hand, undecided, and then pulled the object from the coarse grit. The hum stopped. It was a box a little bigger than the size of her hand and completely battered. Nothing but barnacles and sea-worn wood. Its hinges oozed a rusty red. A tiny keyhole stared from its center. Nothing betrayed its contents as she turned it over in her hands. Keela looked around. When diving, there were rules about what you could take depending on where you were, but she was still this was a protected nature park, which meant the box was protected too. A nature park belonged to the people. She was a St. Rutan. What's here belongs to me too, at least in part, she reasoned. Keela felt like she was in one of Mum's folk tales. The box breathed a strangeness that she couldn't shake. Small and crumbling, it seemed harmless. Her ears pounded with indecision. Everything else had been taken from her. Yet here was something as lost and alone as she was and it had called to her, had wanted her to find it. Keela, Lucy yelled again. I'm coming. Keela's fingers tightened around the box and she shoved it into her bag. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And I have a giveaway also that's uh, in the form. So please feel free to fill it out if you would like to win a copy of my book. Thank you again.